Good afternoon and welcome to the Computational Science Colloquium Series. Today I have the pleasure to welcome Ignacio Sepulveda, who is a new faculty in civil engineering. And uh, he actually uh, is working on some aspects that are very interesting about tsunamis. And I'm hoping to collaborate with him at least to with our group in post ocean dynamics. We'll be happy. And, <laughs> and uh, so he's going to. Uh, talk to you or to us about some harsh assessments using probability. Thank you, Jose. And thank you everyone for coming and, and for this great invitation to show you a little bit about my research of the past eight years. Oh my gosh, I'm getting very old. <laughs> so today I will talk about probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. If someone is not familiar with that concept, Today, you will learn about what is that and, and what are the challenges and how we are doing that. Um, I want to take advantage to, to, to acknowledge here all the collaborators I have had in these last eight years, uh, people from the National University of Singapore, people from Cornell, where I did the PhD, and people from IGPP, from the Institute of Geophysics at Scripps here in San Diego. So, I'm coming from Chile, southern Chile, uh, from my hometown, which is Valdivia. And Valdivia is very famous because it was the closest city to the greatest earthquake in the world, which is the 1960 earthquake magnitude 9.5, Richter scale. Okay, that earthquake was so huge, so massive, that actually here you can see the difference after the earthquake. And right now, this was a picture taken uh, last summer when I was visiting Chile. And that earthquake, that big event was associated with a big tsunami, one of the biggest tsunamis in the world, actually the biggest we have ever modeled or recorded. Uh, and also it was associated with several landslides uh, close to the Andean Mountains, which actually threat, uh, threat to, to destroy completely the city of Valdivia because basically created some dams uh, uh, after a lake which was accumulating water due to those that. So of course, during my childhood, always I live related with these huge large scale geophysical processes, uh, earthquakes and tsunamis and, and other, and how vulnerable we are about those, those events. Actually, because of my, of my interest to, to the nature, I, I used to sail in Chile. I have some friends who have sailed, so I have been sailing in the south of Chile. And always I have been interested about the fact that every time when we are learning how to model, um, uh, tsunamis or, or tides or, 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 or any, any other physical process in nature, I can realize how far we are from the real process that we are observing in nature. What, what are the errors we have in our models or even more, what are the uncertainties and, and, and all what is related with the natural process that is taking place in, 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 the, in the coastal area or, or offshore. So that is how I have devoted my career to study coastal hazards uh, from, from an understanding of the physical model, how we can improve those physical models in order to understand extreme events. Uh, furthermore, how to understand the uncertainties or how we can even increase the amount of collected data or the instrumentation or the technologies in order to measure the coastal environment or offshore. So, Right now, since August, uh, I'm starting this uh, very small, just me right now, which is the San Diego State University Coastal Engineering Lab. Uh, I hope to collaborate with, with, with your group as well, Jose. Uh, right now, uh, I'm, I'm taking care or, or I'm, I'm focusing on three main areas which are related with my recent, re recent research, which is tsunami and airplane modeling, uh, probabilistic hazard assessment, which will be the topic of this talk today. And also, um, I have some interest about remote sensing or other ways we can sense the coastal environment. Okay, just a brief uh, description or, or trying to put in perspective what happened with tsunamis in, in the US in a specific. Here I'm showing you a bar a graph with the death toll related with some recent tsunami events in the US. As you can see, actually the death toll is not so large. Okay, not so many people died during these uh, past tsunami events in, in the US. Okay, 
However, we start to think about, okay, maybe this is because uh, we are not seeing the whole statistic about what is going on really with tsunami in the US. Maybe we are only observing the last 100 years. Actually, here you can see only tsunamis since the 1946 in the Hawaii, Alaska affected area. And maybe we have to take care about some processes or some tsunamis which are happening, for example, with a recurrence of 1,000 years, okay? So this is why we have to take care about events which actually happen with a very low uh, recurrence, for example, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Now the question is why we should take care about events which are happening with a very rare, rare, rare time, like we are talking about 1,000 years as a mean recurrence event or even more. Well, for example, if we do a very simple Poisson, uh, if we adopt a very simple Poisson model, and we consider, for example, the average age of a person living here in the US, which is about 79 years, we can see that actually, if we compute the probability of having one event with a recurrence of 1,000 years, it's actually 7.6%. That percentage is actually very similar to the probability or the risk to contract, for example, some deadly cancer during our lifetime. For example, if we compare with the, with the, with the statistic related with breast cancer, for example, which is about 9.6%, according to, to some charts in, on, on internet related with the, with the incidence of, of cancer. So therefore, we have a risk in our lifetime if we are living, of course, next to the coast, which is significant, it's not negligible. Okay, related with this type of 1,000 year events. And another perspective or another thing is related with what, what has happened in other countries with this event that happened every 1,000 years, more or less in that order. For example, in the 2011 Japanese earthquake, we, got, we could see that actually the death toll was significant, significantly high, 20, 23,000 fatalities. And the cost related with that event was very high, okay, $300 billion. Uh, for the 2004 Indonesian earthquake and tsunami, uh, uh, the, 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 the death toll was even higher. But however, maybe the costs were a little smaller as compared to what happened in, in Japan. Okay, but the message here is that we are dealing with events in the order of 1,000 years, maybe more, maybe less, uh, which actually is significant for our lifetime is we are, if we are thinking or planning to live our whole life in San Diego, for example. Uh, for each of these events, we have a significant cost. We will have property loss and a significant debt toll if we don't do anything. And finally, with this, those numbers, we have to say something. We have to do something as a stakeholder. For example, what will be our mitigation measures in order to reduce the debt toll or the or the or the property loss that we may have with those huge events. Okay, but before to do that, all those decisions we have to come up with some probabilities of some numbers which can allow us to take decision. And those probabilities or those numbers are coming from probability tsunami hazard assessment. Okay, so this. The history or the timeline of the evolution of tsunami hazard assessment uh, can be classified in three big events or three, three milestones in which we were changing the approaches in order to assess the hazard related with tsunamis. So starting in the 1991, uh, this is actually every time when you see on internet the first version of the Microsoft Flight Simulator or, a, or a, an Atari game, that is actually a picture of the first tsunami model created in the world. And actually uh, one of the collaborators on that tsunami model was Philip Liu, which, who was my PhD um, advisor. Um, those models were very simple. Basically you had to prescribe an initial condition, basically an initial condition of the surface elevation in the area where you are generating a tsunami, for example, in the place where you are having an earthquake. So the earthquake is generating a certain seismic deformation uh, on the seafloor. That seafloor perturbation is creating an initial condition. And finally, you have a propagation of tsunami waves, which behave typically as long waves. 
So using these models, for example, this very simple model or using some more sophisticated model right now, for example, the uh, Oclo from Randy Levesque in, in Washington University yeah, or Concord, which, which is the model that, that developed my advisor, you can come up with this kind of maps in which for a certain airway scenario, with a certain initial condition, you can understand what is the maximum tsunami elevation uh, related with that event. And from that information, you can come up with some flood maps or try to understand how, how, how far or how, how, how high the water of the tsunami will reach over certain urban areas. Of course, with the time, we started to realize that actually if you are having a certain earthquake with a certain magnitude, if you have another earthquake with the same magnitude, the tsunami not necessarily will be the same. Why? Because the, the process of an earthquake is so complex that you have many characteristics which are changing. So if you have, for example, an earthquake of magnitude nine, that magnitude nine will be different from a next earthquake of magnitude nine. The characteristic will be different, okay? And because of that, we can see that actually the response of the tsunami is uncertain. It's uncertain due to the uncertainties of the earthquake characteristic. And around in the 2000s, people started to work with new method in which instead of showing a certain value, of the maximum tsunami height, we come up with some distribution of the, for a given certain tsunami height, what is the probability to exceed that, that, that value? And then we came up with this distribution of, of a tsunami behavior. Then in 2004, more or less, uh, thanks to a guy who was the first person who developed the, the, the latest approach, we started to include the recurrence of the tsunami genic source. In a specific, we started to work with earthquakes and we started to include the, 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 the recurrence of the earthquakes. And for that, we are using a typical geophysical model, which is the Gutenberg Richter. And by using the Gutenberg Richter, we can associate a certain arrival random model in order to associate the occurrence of an earthquake and finally the recurrence or the, the occurrence of a tsunami. And that is how we arrive to this expression, which actually can be related with a Boisson process model or a binomial distribution model, in which now you can have a certain tsunami height and then the probability to exceed that certain tsunami height given a certain exposure time, for example, 100 years. So that value is actually very interesting for civil engineering because, for example, if you are designing a board which will have a lifetime of 100 years, now, with this chart, you can understand what is actually the probability of, for example, reaching that port uh, given a tsunami in that area. Okay? And that is, that is the state of the art or, or the method that we are using in civil engineering to assess tsunami hazard, which is very similar to what we are doing with earthquakes, actually. The probabilistic seismic hazard assessment developed by Ian Cornell in the 1968 is basically the same idea. Okay, so in my research, I usually use the uh, Poisson process model in which basically the probability of not having a certain event with average recurrence lambda will have this probability. So basically the probability of not having events is given by this exponential distribution. Now, if we have several uh, tsunamigenic sources, for example, different zones with different earthquakes, finally we can do a superposition just doing the product or the summation of the power in order to consider different areas with sources of tsunamis. And finally, we know that not all the earthquakes, for example, magnitude 9 generate exactly the same tsunami, so in order to consider that uncertainty or that variability of the tsunami behavior, Finally, we adopt what we call the Stinnett version of the Poisson process, in which basically we include this very famous and value uh, that I use a lot of time, which is the value of pi, which basically is a conditional probability to see what is actually the, the probability to exceed a certain value of tsunami parameter hc, given that you have a certain earthquake act, for example, an earthquake magnitude 9. And finally, the probability of having that event is actually the complement of this expression. 
And then we come up with a typical and the classic probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment model based on a Poisson process model. This same expression can be replaced by a binomial distribution. Okay, so in this expression, what can go wrong? Okay, many things can, can go wrong. First of all, we have to think if actually the Poisson process model or the binomial distribution are good models in order to represent the arrival of earthquakes and tsunami. That is always the, tip, the typical question we have had with geophysicists and seismologists related with the occurrence of, of earthquakes. Also, another very important that we will address later in this presentation is related with the fact that because the climate is changing, and for example, in the case of, of coastal areas, we have a sea level rise, the statistics are actually changing in time. And because of that, now we have to modify the typical Poisson distribution model in which we are assuming that the lambdas are actually stationary. Now we have to consider a non-stationary value of lambda. Also, we have a problem with that lambda, which is actually related with the average recurrence of earthquake. Uh, we are obtaining those lambda from this Gutenberg-Richter model in order to understand the recurrence of earthquakes. But of course, we are using data from 50 years, which is more or less the, 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 the age or the time we have had seismology with instruments. So therefore, we have a lot of uncertainties related with, for example, big events, for example, magnitude 9 events. Uh, also, another very important question is related if we are really considering all the tsunamigenic earthquake mechanism in our probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. For example, maybe we would skip some seismogenic regions and because of doing that, maybe we are losing a lot of hazard, okay? And another very big question, which actually we work a lot uh, in 2019 is related with the non-seismic sources, okay? In a specific with landslide. Sometimes landslide can create tsunamis and then the question is how you can include landslides or tsunamis generated by landslide in a probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment, which is actually not straightforward at all. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Well, by the when you're summing over I, I that relates to what different magnitudes of I it, earthquakes it, or no, E is related yeah, with different ensembles of earthquakes. For example, I can represent a set of earthquakes of magnitude 8, okay. magnitude 8.5, 8, mag, uh, magnitude 9, etc., etc. Or even different landslides, for example. Different types of sources. So if you're having a probabilistic distribution for the height exceedance, why not a probabilistic distribution for the uh, temporal repetition? Next one that you pick probability for one term, uh -huh. on the other. Well, the thing is, for the non-stationary, we are doing something like that. We are we are taking advantage of the non-overlapping intervals in order to change things in time. You will see it later, but actually, that is the idea that I'm, how I'm including sea level rise. You will see it later. It's super simple, actually. Okay, other problems, for example, are related with how we are obtaining this value of pi, which is the conditional probability, which has to deal with physical models or numerical models in order to model tsunamis and earthquakes, and also has a part of, a, of a stochastic modeling, modeling in which we are trying to generate, for example, samples of earthquakes. Okay, there are many questions related about how accurate or, 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 or how good are our models related uh, to these physical models in order to get PI. So we need a lot of research in order to improve the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. In my PhD, I work with these two aspects. First of all, I work with a, with a new synthetic earthquake model based on a random field in order to create synthetic earthquakes, okay? And I, I won't go too much about the, the, the approaches or the, or the techniques I'm using in order to create a synthetic earthquake model. And also I focus on the uncertainty propagation. Basically having an uncertainty in the earthquake or in any other uh, uncertainty source, you have to do the propagation in order to get the values of the conditional probability PI. In order to do that, you can use a Monte Carlo simulation, but since you are dealing with so many dimensions, random dimensions, 
you need something better. And for that, we were using uh, something which we call the stochastic reduce order model, which basically is a kind of an optimized Monte Carlo simulation in which we smartly select the samples in order to do the propagation by doing an optimization before doing the, the physical simulations. And today, what I will present you is two of my recent work. First of all, how we are including the uncertainties related with bathymetry. And second, I will show you what we are doing with this problem of the stationarity of the, of the statistics in order to include sea level rise, basically using the idea that you were saying. <laughs> okay, this is my other advisor, Mr. Gregory, saying models are not always perfect. <laughs> and we have to accept that. Okay, a brief summary about my thesis work in back in 2017. So basically, this is what we were, what I was telling you about the Gutenberg Richter curve in order to get recurrence of, of earthquake. So basically, assuming that you have a fractal behavior, you can get the frequency or the recurrence of certain airways which has a smaller magnitude. And from them, you can try to come up with an estimation of the, of the recurrence of airways that have larger magnitude. For example, having little airways until magnitude 7, you can try to come up with a frequency of magnitude 9 hertz. And this is done for three seismogenic regions, which are showing here for the Manila Trench. Okay, we were analyzing tsunamis in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So after doing that, we, uh, we apply this uh, earthquake Synthetic earthquake model, which I created during my PhD. Actually, here you have two samples of the split distribution of the earthquake. And using this stochastic reduce order model, which is kind of the Monte Carlo simulation, finally, I could come up with this nice distribution of the probability of exceeding a certain maximum tsunami elevation during 100 years. Okay, for six locations in three in Kaushu and three in Hong Kong. Okay, so now I will show you what I did in 2000, 2019, 2020, more or less. This was part of my postdoc research. Okay, so bathymetry. How will we include the uncertainty of bathymetry in probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment? That is the big question I was trying to answer uh, during my postdoc. So, as many of you may know, uh, Bedouin Mandelbrot came up with the idea of the self-similarity of fractals, which basically we, we got the concept of fractals, okay? Donald Turcotte also did a lot of work in terms of geology at Cornell and here at California in Berkeley, I think, uh, trying to actually try to define the, the concept of geofractology, which is basically fractals applied to geology. Uh, from those studies, I would say the common, the common topic was related with the fact that if we are observing the topography or the seafloor topography, which we call the bathymetry, you will see that you have actually a fractal behavior. That fractal behavior is expressed in a power law decay when we are plotting the power spectral density of this topography field, okay? So that is a very strong pro uh, concept and actually allow us to know something about what is going on, for example, with very high scale or highway number context, which we commonly are not able to capture, for example, with our technologies in order to measure some processes. Uh, one of the very good examples about that problem of getting highway number content of processes is the way we are measuring bathymetry. You maybe don't know, but right now, right today, we only have mapped only 11% of the oceans with ships. So only the 11% of the surface of the ocean have been visited by a ship and we have get a depth in those areas. Only 11%, which is super poor. Okay, so what we can do with the rest of the ocean? Okay, there is a very nice technique actually mainly developed by, by, well, not invented, but developed in real for application by Dave Samuel, uh, a professor in, at Scripps, who said, okay, maybe what we can do is try to take advantage 
of satellite altimetry data from the ocean surface and try to get the anomalies of gravity in the ocean surface. And from the anomalies in the sea surface, try to come up or infer what happened in the seafloor and try to get the topography of the seafloor. Okay? When we are doing that process, basically we are trying to deal with the gravity potential and try to infer what happened in a lower level. Okay? When we are doing that and we are trying to get information of a lower level from the upper level, which is the ocean surface, we have a problem of upward continuation, which basically does not allow us to get the amplitude or to get the characteristic of the highway number content. We have a damping of the amplitude of this highway number content. So, at the end, the problem is that every time we have satellite altimetry data trying to come up with a bathymetry model, we will see that actually the estimation is a very smooth version of the real topography or the real bathymetry. This is measurements made by the ship, and this is an estimation obtained with satellite gravity data. And you can see we are missing all the highway number content in these estimations. Okay? So what we will do? By knowing that we are lacking of that highway number content, what we can try to do is try to come up with synthetic samples as a random field model in order to build this graph. Basically, try to put samples of highway number content in samples of bathymetry. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned 11% of the floor is mapped. Does that mean 11% is good spacing? Can, that is, or is it the surface 11 and then the remaining 89 is not mapped? I, I, I forgot to take that very important detail that all geophysicists forget to tell. That 11% is coming when you are dividing the oceans in a grid with the squares of um, 15 R seconds by 15 R seconds. At the Ecuador, the separation between nodes in that grid is like 500 meters by 500 meters. If you separate all the ocean in that grid with 15 R seconds, you will see that 11% of those nodes have had a ship close to them so they can get the depth on that on those nodes. The rest, 89%, uh, never have seen a, a ship near by. So therefore, you need to get this satellite altimetry data in order to do the estimation. Even that 11% is on a grid of 500 kilometers. Exactly. Okay. Even, even worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. So before to try to assume that topography or bathymetry is fractal, what I did was something super simple. I went to those places where we have the 11%, where we have ships, ship data, and I did a comparison between the gravity model and the ship data, okay? So what we should expect? We should expect to have an error, which is related with the highway number content we are not capturing with the satellite. Super simple. Okay, in fact, this is the, this is a, this is the, the power spectral density, which is in 2D, I just collapsed it to, to one dimension. And you can see how we can obtain a very nice power decay law in 15 samples in 15 different radios around the world. Okay? We have some, some, some white, sometimes white distribution, which is actually related that we, that we have some anisotropy in the random field. Okay? And that is actually related with something we will do in the future. Also, because we have this fractal behavior, this power spectral density, which is like a power decay law, another very important thing is that the RMS or the variance of the error of the highway number content can be related with the actual variance we are obtaining in the long wave number content, in the low wave number content yet, that we are obtaining with the satellite model. So using the satellite model, we can get the variance of the data we are already capturing and try to come up with an estimate of the variance of the error in the bathymetry. Yep. Okay. Um, can you, I'm sorry, clarify what's on the x axis and the y axis? Like on the bathymetry, you have the x axis and the y axis. So the x axis is like the, 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 the
del, del logaritmi, y logaritmi es que de wavelength in units of one over kilometer. ¿Ok? And here you have the, the normalized power spectral density. ¿Ok? Ok. And here you have the standard deviation of the low wave number content and the standard deviation of the high wave number content. Okay. Another very important thing, and this is related with a question I did a couple of weeks ago, when someone was presenting some Gaussian models in order to, to simulate some processes. What I did here also was to try to get histograms of the, of the errors that I'm obtaining in, this, in these areas where I have measurements. Okay, the size of these fields are very large, very several times the characteristic wavelength of the, of the error. So, so we can say with confidence that the histogram around the field are more or less the statistic of the one point distribution, okay, of a single point. Basically the marginal distribution that we would need in our, in our random field model. And what we can see is actually in many places, the, um, the distribution, the empirical distribution of the error has a very heavy tail, actually. And if you can see the green curve, sometimes it's much better representing the shape of the black histogram, which are the empirical. That green curve is actually a double exponential, which we call the Laplacian distribution. And that has heavier tails as compared to the Gaussian distribution. So in this model, what we will try is try to generate random field samples, but from a non-Gaussian random field, not a Gaussian, not a Gaussian uh, random field. Okay, and this is the trick. Okay, in real life, what we will have is a certain map of topography in which in some places we have non ships. So basically we are only having the estimation of from the satellite, but in other places like here in the black dot, we have a lot of ship measurements. So basically what we expect is that in this area where we have surveys, we will have all the high-wave number content, but in the places where we don't have ships, we will have only the low-wave number content. So in order to include those problems in which we are having ships and we are not having ships, which is typically the bathymetry data we obtain from GEPCO or other, other bathymetry models that are available in, on the internet, in order to apply in those data sets, we will try something which we call the conditional random, in which we will, we will consider that the uncertainty or the standard deviation in places we, where we have surveys, the uncertainty is zero, and only we will include uncertainty in the places where we won't have surveys. Okay? So basically, creating this conditional Gaussian random field, then we apply a cartoonial of expansion, which is an eigenvalue decomposition. Uh, I guess. Many people is familiar with the cartoon of expansion. Yep. Oh, I'm kind of tired. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so finally we got the cartoon of expansion in order to generate Gaussian random field samples. And finally, in order to correct for the fact that the marginal distribution is not Gaussian in our problem, instead, if Laplace is Laplace or double exponential, we come out with a nonlinear transformation. Okay? And finally, we can get some samples of the highway number content with a Laplacian marginal distribution and, um, and the covariance related with this fractal behavior. And here as an example, we have this same sample here without the black dots. Okay, you can see highway number content here. Here you can see very smooth patterns. So here I add this sample of the random field to this data coming from the internet. And finally, you come up with two samples of bathymetry in which you are including the highway number one as a sample. <clears throat> okay. Maybe I should remove the mask because yeah, you can remove it. Yeah, that is much That's better. Could you remove it that way? Okay, so here? Yes. So when you do this, thank you. When you do this for one for for which you know everything, mm -hmm. and then you compare how close is to the reality. Like this sample with, for example, another another place where we have the, the 
Well, of course, they will be different, but if you compare the spectrum, will be the same because basically they are representing the same fractal behavior. But of course, because you are not getting the real thing, but you, basically you are consistent with the statistic description of what is going on with the seafloor topography. But you are not consistent or you are not the same as the real topography or seafloor topography that you have. Exactly. Okay, so this is a very simple example. So here we have three grids, okay, from bathymetry. So this is the course grid. Here in this white uh, square, here I have this nested grid. And inside this nested, nested grid, I have another one, which is this one. And actually here I'm doing a zoom in in the city of Iquique in north of Chile. And what I will do is try to include the bathymetry uncertainty from this bathymetry model in front of Chile, okay? So here the yellow and red colors are indicating the value of the variance. Of course, when you are close to the ship data, you have a very small uncertainty and when you have a, a significant distance from the data, you will have a lot of uh, variance, which is related with this scaling law I was proposing in, a, in, in some, some, some slides, uh, previous slides. Okay, so I will use this random field. I, in this case, I created like 10,000 samples of bathymetry, basically 10,000 samples of highway number content. And I started to run some tsunami models with exactly the same initial condition. In this case, I'm using the 2014 tsunami in Northern Chile, okay? Which was a magnitude 8.1. So I started to make this 10,000 tsunami simulations, and I got the mean of the maximum tsunami and the variance of the um, maximum tsunami elevation. Okay? So here, one important thing is that the uncertainty is always very tight close to the shore. Okay? Uh, and in the offshore, actually, the uncertainty is not so important or it's not so sensitive the waves when are, they are traveling offshore. They are more sensitive when they are very close to the shore. Okay? Sorry, Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. So I understand clear that you have a very coarse grid and you have one? Two nested grids, one over just, the other. Just not multiple nested grids? Or no, one. only two. I'm going from 2.4 2 kilometers to 100 meters with a step of five times the resolution. That's the resolution I'm using. Why? So I'm going from the, the resolution of the grid here. So you're, you're entering the fine scale on the last grid from just one very good tree, right? So basically everything is uncertain. Yeah. Okay. The grid here has a resolution or a separation between nodes of 2.5 kilometers. Then I change to 500 uh, meters. And then I change to 100 meters. And all of them has a random, um, a random, a random field sample. But I always take care that in the edges of the nested grids, I have the same value as the as the course split. So I don't have jumps in the random field sample. Yeah, but you have three. I have three. Yeah, three nested grid. Yeah. But I just said, two. are you inferring the small the high wavelength number on the on the course grid from the generation? Basically you can you can generate the random the mm -hmm. random field okay. sample for the three of them. Okay. And you only have to take care that you are consistent with what is going on at the borders. Yeah. Basically, I created three different random field samples, and I took care about the treatment in order to have a smooth transition from the corset to the final. So they're all Cartesian. Okay. Yeah, it's just Cartesian in this case. Yeah, but you can do it with other with other other type of coordinates. Yeah. Okay. So to get inside. Because now we are observing very clear that it, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty is focused on the shallow part, which is actually kind of expected. 
because the, the wavelength of the tsunami start to get shorter when it start to go to, to shallow areas and therefore start to feel that high wave number content of the bacteria. Okay, but for gaining more insight about what is going on with the tsunami waves, we can go... Yep. But basically you focus in the finer resolution, right? I'm trying to get the results everywhere. Yeah, I know. But uh, the, in the Kike City. From here you go up. This one, I don't know, but I do nesting. I try to get information from high up or I know in the in the comfort model you're supposed to have a connection between both from large to, to small and small to large. You're, su you're supposed to have a connection between both. You are not only going in one direction. No, no, no I understand. But uh, let's say that if, if I look at currents, mm -hmm. the currents come from, you know, from way outside in the ocean and I'm going to the poles. Mostly that's just that's to produce a boundary information yes. to the... But, but in the case of tsunami, sometimes you will have a, uh, you will have a reflection from the coast and you uh, will have some signal going out. So you really need the other direction as well. Yeah, you can not only live with one direction. Okay, so this is the time history in some specific times, in, in some specific locations, sorry, which are indicated here. Okay, I try to understand what happened with the time histories at different locations around my my tsunami simulation. And what we found is very, very interesting, but again, kind of expected. This is the time histories of the tsunamis, and actually each of the black lines are related with one of these uh, bathymetry samples. So basically here we have the 10,000 tsunami simulations. And in all of them, what you can see is that actually the first wave actually is very certain. You don't have dispersion of results here. You can see everywhere. The only problems where the only places where you have problem is, for example, in shallow areas like in Iquique, in Iquique I have two points where you can see that actually the largest way is not the first one, but maybe the, the third or the fourth way. Okay. And in those places is where you are having this very high uncertainty in the previous plot. Okay. So this is very good news because basically showing us that, for example, if we want to establish an early warning system we can kind of do a very good job with the first leading way, okay, in order to create the alarm and try to set the people when they have to leave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we will do a terrible job with the second, third, and fourth ways. We have a lot of uncertainty, and especially in Chile, where we don't have too much bathymetry information in order to do something good. Okay, so connecting with the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment, Basically, you can take all the maximum from this time history and you create this distribution given the characteristic of the bathymetry. And those distributions are no more than the value of the conditional PI. So we can take these values of PI now and include it in a probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. Okay, moving forward with this work, um, we can see that in some places, we can see clearly some anisotropy of the statistics, okay? And those are related with that thick dispersion in our power spectra that I showed you before. So in order to model them, we will need to improve uh, our random field models and for example, try to include some anisotropy, which is actually changing in space. And for that, I'm writing some codes, which I call Garfield, which is geophysical applications of random fields. Okay, and I'm working on that code right now since last year, trying to improve these random field models, which maybe has even other applications for other, other problems, not only tsunamis or, or, or geophysics. Even. Okay, um, this is the last, the last topic I have 10 minutes. Maybe I can finish to show you everything. So we have the following problem right now. We have climate change. We cannot deny that. Uh, of course, we have sea level rise, and we are observing sea level rise right now. Uh, what happened? Well, every time when you have a tsunami, of course, the tsunami will come with different amplitudes, but because you have sea level rise, now the tsunami wave is riding over a higher place, or once the years are going, are, are passing, we will start to see that now tsunami waves can 
can write over a higher sea level, and that means that they will be able to uh, reach higher land. And that is a big problem, and not only a big problem uh, for, well, for engineering, it's a big problem, but also it's a big problem or a big, a big issue for this uh, probably classic probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment, because you have the problem that things are changing in time. But as you were saying, because we have this, um, this um, uh, stationary random field model, now what we can do with this Poisson is try to take advantage of the independence between not overlapping times and try to create a non-stationary Poisson process. So basically that formula, which is the classic formulation we have used in the previous studies, can, can, can be changed to this. So basically right now, we have a value of this conditional probability, but now this conditional probability changes in time, or it's a, it's a function of time. So basically in order to get the overall behavior, we just, we just only have to compute an integral uh, over time, which is a kind of an average of this recurrence of, of tsunamis. And in order to do that, in order to implement that formulation, we, we, we work with a surrogate model, in which we compute tsunamis for certain collocation epochs or certain times in which we have a certain sea level. And finally, by doing an interpolation, we try to come up with, with a quadrature in order to compute and to calculate that integral in time. Okay, and here is a very simple video which is show, showing what is going on. So here we have the integral. Okay, and this integral is from zero to the exposure time. For example, a board is designed to work during 30 years, during 50 years, during 100 years. So what we can see is that once we are start to increase the exposure time of the lifetime of the project, we start to see that the curve, which is related with that recurrence or average recurrence, start to change with time. What is the order of the quadrature? Sorry? The order of the quadrature that you use. It's just too super simple. Yeah, I can do it better, but I think in order to improve the quadrature, I need more collocation epochs rather than improve the order of the quadrature. Yeah, I need to put more points. Yeah. Actually, I have to refine that because I do it something super simple. A very simple quadrature. Okay. And answering the question of my former postdoc uh, boss, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer was saying, okay, you are having a formulation in order to deal with this non-stationary process, but now what is going on with the uncertainty of the sea level rise? Now, right now, one of the major problems with the sea level rise is that we don't even know what will happen in the next 100 years. We are not sure if we will completely screw up, or maybe we will try to compensate all the responsibility we had a couple of years ago. So because of that, there are many different scenarios related with the, which are called the RCP scenarios, the representative uh, climate, uh, oh, I forgot the, the acronym. Okay, but you have different scenarios of the sea level rise. And here you can see by using that uh, non-stationary Poisson process, uh, first of all, you have in segmented line the classic probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment result, not including sea level rise, and then the other curves are related with the uh, with the new formulation, including sea level rise, with different scenarios of sea level rise. And you can see actually that the difference are huge and important. Okay, here I don't want to be alarmistic because actually here the effect is super important because the tsunamis in South China Sea related with the Manila Trench has a low recurrence and are small tsunamis. The magnitudes of those tsunamis are comparable to the sea level rise. We are talking about one meter, two meters. Because of that, the effect seems super high. But for example, if I include sea level rise maybe in Japan or in Chile, maybe the effect would be small, okay? Finally, the sea level rise effect will be important if that effect is comparable to the tsunamis you are studying. Okay, and with this we kill a lot of myths because actually there are about two papers in Science and Nature saying like sea level rise, sea level rise will double the tsunami hazard. Yeah, 
in, in Hong Kong, in China, of course, but in Chile, maybe nothing. It will be a super marginal effect that of the, of the sea level rise. Okay, here I have another comparison, which is showing this alarmistic, this, uh, this, this alarming uh, result in which I show you the 100 years uh, probability to get flooded in Hong Kong for 100 years, here without, without sea level rise and here with sea level rise. Of course, the difference are huge. Okay, but only because the tsunami is comparable to the sea level rise. Okay, and finally, these are results that I obtained last week. So actually it's very, very, very fresh results. Now I'm trying to include tides in the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment, okay? And actually the treatment in order to include uh, tides is very simple, okay? So basically we have the same problem in which we have some uh, tsunami getting source with some intensity sea time. Then I have a certain sea level or still water level in which we have the trend of the sea level rise. And for each event, I will have some, some variations which are related with the tide. And finally, we have a result of the tsunami intensity at the coast at different times during the exposure time. Okay, here I show you the time histories of tides in Kaohsiung and in Hong Kong, and here a histogram for 36 years. Typically for tides, you would like to have a statistic for 19 years, which is the metonic cycle. Okay, here are close to the level of that. So aren't the tides, the height of tides, empirical data based on current sea level? Sea level this, is, this is sea level's real measurements at the port of caution. And but okay. if your sea level is rising, yeah, you will have the problem of, of the trend. Do you know the tide? Yeah, the well, tides? actually, what I understand is that they correct that every certain amount of year. So they try to remove the average during the year of during two years, I think, but there is a treatment. Yeah, because otherwise you will see that this thing will start to go up, go up, go up. Yeah. But they are correcting at a certain point. I don't remember what was the period in which they are doing the, the moving average, but there is an average, uh, certainly, yeah. And especially not only because they were thinking about sea level rise, but because typically the instruments are located in a pier, for example, and then the piers start to sing or start to, to go up. So basically it's just a technical thing that they say, okay, let's forget about possible trends and we remove everything what is residual. Exactly. Yeah. Actually here in the scripts, I was talking with Dana Kakamais, who is in charge of the leveling of the script spear and the tight gauges there. And it's crazy. He says that the, the, the pier is like rotating and he was showing me the, the displacement he has had during 10 years in that field. And it's, it's significant. Okay, so one way to include the tides in the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment, of course, is to try to include tides as a random number inside the conditional probability PI. Okay, so at the end, what we are doing here is that including that random number of the tides which is super simple, but takes a lot of time because basically you will have to include another random dimension in your, in your stochastic reduce order model and it will need, you will need more time in order to run that, that kind of Monte Carlo simulation to get the same accuracy because you are including another random dimension. Another very simple way, which I'm working right now on this, is basically trying to do a partition of the, of the tidal range assign a certain probability to each of these delta, delta eta, eta is the value of the tide, and finally come up with a weighted average between different states of tides, which is super simple. And here, just finishing here, I'm showing you again in segmented lines, the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment without sea level rise and without tides. The red and the black are showing the two techniques in order to include tides into probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment. These are the new results I obtained a couple of days ago. In Hong Kong, we are doing a very good job. Both schools are, are almost doing the same. However, in Kaohsiung, I'm having some problems. I think I know what is going on there. It's, pro it's a problem with the supergate model. And um, finally, the, the, the segmented group is the BTHA, the probabilistic tsunami hazard assessment uh, with sea level, sea level rise and without tides. And the solid blue line is 
uh, probability tsunami kappa assessment with types and with syllable words. That means everything. So the solid blue line is the best of the best. And you can see, for example, in Hong Kong, where the tsunamis are smaller, you can have a very important impact of both types and tsunamis. So finally, as a conclusion, um, well, more data and statistics are needed and need to be collected in order to understand better the tsunami hazard, uh, because all these uncertainties I have, I have, I have shown you in this presentation, um, more, sophistic, more sophisticated physical model, for example, I'm, I'm always interested about what is going on really in the tsunami generation zone. Uh, we typically try to work with, um, with, with shallow, with long wave theory, but actually there are some dispersion effects in the, in the generation zone, which needs to be simulated with another model, not only the shallow water model, and actually I'm working on a, on a new model for that. Uh, and in terms of stochastic model, of course, we have a lot of new sources of uncertainty that we haven't studied yet. Okay, so still a lot of to do with that. And finally, as a second major objective related with this hazard assessment is what is going on with coastal communities. How we are learning how to communicate these values to the general people, to the general public, how we are talking about probabilities with people. And finally, and something, and actually we are, we are writing a proposal now with people, with social scientists in order to see how we can take advantage of what the people is observing in the coast in order to increase our uh, observational data of extreme events, for example, for tsunamis. So that's all. Uh, well, everybody, everyone, thank you. So, so everybody is welcome to, to contact me uh, if you have any idea related with completely, a completely, totally different application for this thing. You are completely welcome and we can try to find something. If you have a new idea in order to improve the things that you saw here, of course, also you are more than welcome and, and we can try to do something together. Any so, questions? Thank you. Please. About the to coastal communities, how, how do you plan, or is that like your policy, or through other individuals? Okay, this is this that idea about the, the social community is coming from a paper I wrote last year, which actually was a super high impact paper, two papers actually, in which we were using the videos from social media in order to understand the origin of a tsunami. And that thing was super important and, and finally opened our eyes. Uh, showing that actually people can finally, with all the recordings, because the people is curious and, and they are recording things, how we can take advantage of, of all those videos of cost of extreme events and try to take advantage with some processing techniques in order to improve our models, for example. Another dimension or another moving forward on that idea is also try to see how we can educate people or how we can do a pilot group, for example, in which we can educate people how they can measure or they can observe coastal events and try to get information from them. That would be a super cool thing. Actually, the idea is, is not new. Actually, I always try to replicate what or try to think on, on the idea of Ebert. Have you ever heard about Ebert? It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an app in the cell phone in which you can do birding. You can try to take pictures to birds and, and basically there is a huge database and a lot of people working on that. And the ornithology lab in Cornell are using all that data from the people in that app in order to understand what is the migration and the, and the, and the dynamic of the, of the population of birds all around the world. So I'm thinking why we cannot do the same with coastal hazards. People can take picture videos we can infer information from those videos and we can try to increase our observational data. Well, the, actually there is another idea I'm working on and actually I, let me see if I can go to that picture. There you go. So one of the one of the things that we can take advantage is about the videos and, and 
and pictures that we can obtain from Twitter, from Instagram, from YouTube, from, from Facebook, etc. That is the most primitive way to do this and try to collect the data and, 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 and get some inference. Of it. But however, that is imperfect because the people is not thinking about science. It's thinking about they are super curious because it's this huge scale event happening in front of their eyes. So in order to improve that, we have to do the something similar that Ebert uh, is doing. And that is try to educate the citizen science in order to get better pictures, videos, etc. Another evolution also to that same, that same idea is try to take advantage of other sensors that we have, for example, in smartphones. And that is one of the ideas I have here, which is actually a measurement of waves and sea levels using GPS antennas. Here I'm using, I have an antenna right now at a strip sphere doing that technique. I, it's related with reflections and you can obtain water levels and, and waves with a, an accuracy of 10 centimeters more or less. But during the summer in Chile, I realized that we can use the GPS antenna of the telephone in order to do exactly the same. So why not? We can try to have an app in which the people are using their GPS antenna or other sensors of the cell phone and try to get more data in order to increase the, the observational data. But now we're going to thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.